If you ain't got there yet, say, oh, me. All right, everybody's there. Everybody's there? All right. Isaiah chapter 29. Let's start reading verse 1. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Add ye year to year, let them kill sacrifices. Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow. And that shall be unto me as Ariel, and I will camp against the round about, and I will lay siege against thee with a mount, and I will raise forts against thee. They're speaking of God is speaking of Jerusalem here. And he said, And thou shalt be brought down and shalt speak of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones uh, shall be as chaff that passeth away. Yea, it shall be at an instant suddenly. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake, and great noise with storm and tempest, and the flame of devouring fire. And the multitude of the nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her, and her munition and that distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall even be as when an hungry man dreameth. And behold, he eateth, but he waketh, and his soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold, he drinketh, but he awaketh, and behold, he is faint, and his soul hath appetite. So shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Zion. I want to preach this morning out of those couple of verses there in uh, uh, verse number 8. Uh, Verse number 8 is that, that great big long verse. It says a whole lot. It said it's like a man that, that goes to bed hungry and during his dream he dreams he eats a big feast and gets satisfied. But then when he wakes up, he's still hungry. And that's what I want to preach about this morning. is a message entitled, You Must Be Dreaming. Amen. You Must Be Dreaming. Amen. The Bible talks a lot about dreams and the Bible... Uh, in the Old Testament, God used to uh, show things through visions and dreams and different things like that, but now we don't get the revealed Word of God. Am I on back there, Travis? Everybody's looking at me like I grew an extra head or something, so I didn't know if I, uh, my mic was turned off. I could just see my lips move. But anyway, uh, we have the uh, completed Word of God now, and we don't trust in dreams and visions. Thank God for that. Some of the dreams I have, boy, if it meant anything, we'd all be in trouble. Ain't you glad? Amen. But uh, have you ever had a dream that was so real? I remember one time years ago, I was pastoring up in South Carolina. I remember one time I dreamed that uh, somebody's trying to get in the house or something like that, and I could hear them outside, and, and they somehow knew that they were armed and, and were going to come in. And I remember when I woke up, Brother Sam, I mean, it was so real that I got I woke up, and the first thing hit my mind, we had a big German shepherd, but he was down the dog lot for some reason. He was put up, and I used to let him run loose at night. He was put up, and I just remembered we'd been target shooting, and I was out of ammunition. And a redneck don't have his dog or his pickup truck or a gun. I mean, he's just helpless. And boy, I got up and went from looking from room to room, and I looked at my family, and I thought, that dream is so real. And sometimes that's the way it is. It seems so real. You'd swear it really happened. You ever had a dream about your kids? And get up and go check on them, make sure they're breathing. You ever done that? Yeah. I remember one night I had a dream, and I dreamed my wife was running around on me. I woke up. I was so mad. I, honest to goodness. I mean, that dream was so mad, I got up and slung the covers back. Hey! Like that. You, what? What's wrong? What's wrong? I said, if you ever run around on me, I'll shoot you dead and kill you. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. I didn't do that. What's wrong? I said, I had a bad dream. Then I got like a big baby. I had a bad dream. Oh, honey, that's okay. You're going to be all right. She's like, shh, boy, that's close. Amen. But really, a dream can seem real. But what he's saying here, it seemed real, but it wasn't. When the man, the man seemed like he was, uh, he was eating a, a meal and he went to bed thirsty and he, and he was uh, in a kind of a famine, famine state and he drank during his dream, but he woke up and didn't have anything. I'll give you a few things about dreaming. You must be dreaming. Number one, if you think that there could be salvation without sacrifice. I want to tell you this morning, brother, salvation is free, but it was not cheap. I want you to know something today. Our salvation is absolutely free. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to do anything. You don't have to do a certain thing or don't do a certain thing to get to heaven. 
but you do have to trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And brother, that was some kind of a costly price that was paid. I mean, brother, every man in the world that's ever lived had some form of sin because he was born in sin and he came out of the womb a sinner. Oh, but Jesus Christ was born pure and innocent and undefiled and no God was found in his mouth. He was perfect and sinless and in his blood was pure and the first man that ever lived that was just, he died for the unjust. The first man that was ever pure died for the impure. The first man that was righteous, he died for the unrighteous. Oh, brother, for me and you, it just don't seem right that the greatest person that ever lived had to die such a brutal, terrible, agonizing death. But thank God it was for you. It was for me. And brother, you're dreaming if you think there's salvation without a sacrifice. The Bible said over there, I was reading the other day, I've been reading that scripture my whole life. But I was reading it again the other day. There's something about that passage in Isaiah chapter 53 where it said it pleased God to bruise him. And the Bible said he was, uh, the iniquity of us all was laid on him. And the Bible said he was, he was wounded for our transgressions. And the Bible goes on to talk about how he was bruised and he was battered. He was beaten. Oh, how he was mistreated. Oh, the love of God that was displayed that day when Jesus Christ suffered for you. I want to tell you, brother, that's a great sacrifice. Listen, when God saw that man sin in the Garden of Eden, brother, he, he started a plan. Uh, brother, he, he started his plan for salvation and all over heaven. Brother, he searched all over heaven like the old song said, and there's nobody could do it. There wasn't anybody that could do it. But thank God Jesus said, I'll go and I'll be the sacrifice. I'll lay myself on the altar and I'll die. I'll shed my blood so they can be saved. I was said in Revelation chapter five. There was a there was a book sealed with seven seals in the hand of, uh, in the hand of him which sitteth upon the throne. And John said, I looked about and said, They all wept because none was found worthy to loose the seals. Oh, but brother, he said, I looked in the midst of the elders. I looked in the midst of the throne of God. And he said, There was one standing as a lamb that had been slain. And he reached and took the book from him which sitteth upon the throne. I want to tell you today, brother, you might think you're a good Good catch. You might think you're a blessing to God, and you might think you're doing some good deed to get to heaven, but you're a low-down, dirty, filthy, stinking, rotten sinner on your way to hell without God, without Jesus Christ. You're burned for all eternity. Amen. The only reason you're sitting here today with your hand up praising God is because of Him. It ain't got nothing to do with you. Amen. Brother Billy sitting here has been preaching... Forty some years, he ain't going to heaven because he preached a long time. He ain't going to heaven because he suffered and he's sick and all the, all the things he's going through in the ministry. Oh, that's a blessing and all that's true. But that ain't what's going to get him through those beautiful, wonderful gates of pearl. That ain't going to be what gets you into the presence of, the, of God Himself. But, brother, it'll be the shed blood of the righteous one, the Holy One of God, that came down and suffered. I said He suffered and He died for you that you can go to heaven. There's no such thing as salvation without sacrifice. The old man never did sin, became sin. You know, Jesus never thought a bad thought or lied. He never took a drink. He never, he never burned one, Brother Sam. But all that stuff you did, all that lying and burning one and drinking and whoremongering and fornication and surfing the Internet and looking at stuff you ought not to do, he took every bit of that upon himself. The Bible said, He who knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him, not in you, but in Him, not in me, but in Him. It's Jesus that makes you right with God. If you ever get that glory to God, you'll shout and you'll cut a run and you'll have yourself a fit. He'll clear you off a spot somewhere and shout a while. 
this crowd thinks they're doing such a good thing, and, and I'm doing all this good work, and I'm going to heaven because I stay right with God, and I pray, and I live right. All those things are good, and you're supposed to do them, but that ain't what gets you to heaven. That's not what makes God put your name down in the Lamb's book of life. It's that sacrifice, brother. It's that dying of His Son on the cross and shed His pure, innocent blood for low-down sinners like me and you. That's what will get you to heaven. You're dreaming if you think they're salvation. Listen, that's like the people in our country. Listen, our flag stands for freedom. What our young people don't understand, it wasn't cheap. That's the price of blood, brother. There's men that's gone overseas and fought and died on foreign soil. In some cases, they weren't even sure where there's that when they died in those jungles and out there on those hills and in them deserts. And they laid there in the desert and bled and died thinking about their mama or thinking about their daddy or thinking about their kids or their wife. And they laid out there and died. And these bunch of snotty-nosed brats running around here protesting, wearing a flag on the seat of their pants. I think we'll have a flag raising buddy and kick it plumb off their bridge. I say, if you don't like America and you can't salute the flag, then get out, brother, and don't come back. Amen. 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 If you'd rather salute Allah and you have a problem with the American flag, go over here and live over there like a bunch of rats and salute something else. Amen, brother. That's good preaching. Even I am doing it. You're dreaming if you think there's salvation without sacrifice. Number two, you are dreaming if you think there's service without suffering. Today, people don't know anything about suffering. But the Bible tells us, brother, that He expects us to suffer. He expects us to go through hard times. He expects us to go through this Christian life and through this walk with God and to have hard times. That develops character and integrity in a Christian. And it does so in the same of the human life. You better know that you're going to suffer. If you're going to serve, you're going to suffer. I want to be a servant preacher. I want to do this. I want to go to the mission field. Get ready to suffer. The night I announced my call to preach, I was 20 years old. And the whole church shouted. My daddy took me off the side and just had to throw a wet blanket on me. He said, now, son, I'm proud of you. But here's what you're going to have to go through, and this is what you're going to face. I thought, what's his problem? I know now what he's talking about. He sat me down. He said, now, son, it ain't always like this. You're going to have to suffer. You're going to go through some stuff you don't like. And there's people that will pat you on the back and take you out to eat and love you and give you a big love offering and will stab you in the back the very first chance they get. I thought, what is he talking about? Daddy's lost it. Brother, it wasn't long that I found out Daddy was right and there is suffering. The Bible said, all them that live godly shall suffer persecution. And, brother, you'll suffer it. And there's no way of suffering without persecution. You'll suffer. You'll suffer by the skeptics. That's those that don't even know if what we believe is really. I ain't too sure about them crazy people. Down there. I don't care. Let them think what they want to do. It don't bother me. When you're young, it bothers you more. But when you get older, I don't know, you just get used to it. And you mellow out a little bit and you just don't care anymore. That's when you really get to where you can do some good. Unfortunately, the kids got all the energy and they ain't got no sense. <laughs> you kids get mad about that, but a few years ago you'll look back and say, that preacher's right. I didn't have a lick sense. Is that right? Everybody knows that's true. It's over 25. Raise your hand. See there? Everybody ain't wrong. That's right. And listen, they'll be suffering from the skeptics and from the scoffers. That's those that'll make fun and laugh and make light of what you believe and what you're doing. And brother, every time you turn around, it's almost daily, it's weekly, you hear about somebody doing something crazy and it'll be on the news and they put us all in the same sack and they make fun of us like we're a bunch of idiots. But the Bible said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. You're going to suffer a little bit. The suffering of skeptics and the scoffers, and they'll also be the suffering of Satan himself. There are going to be times the devil's going to come after you. You might as well get get that through your head. You're dreaming if you think you can serve without suffering. I know modern day Christianity is like this. They think, you know, you carry a Bible and go to church, sing a few songs, and everybody at church loves you, and you go out these doors, and everybody in the community loves you, and everybody around town loves you and applauds you and pats you on the back. Put your name in the paper, what a great person you are. But it ain't like that, people. You're dreaming. 
It's like Alice in Wonderland. It's all a big dream. It's like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Brother, wake up and face reality. There's no way that you're going to have suffering, a service without suffering. If you plan on being a preacher or going to the mission field, or even if you plan on taking a stand for what you believe, you're going to suffer. Ain't that right, Brother William? People are going to laugh at you and say you're crazy. Sit right in your house and argue with you about the Bible. Amen? You're dreaming if you think you can have service without suffering. Amen. Everybody here has served any length of time knows that you'll suffer a little bit in this life if you serve the Lord. Amen. I remember hearing about this young preacher one time. He uh, hadn't been preaching long and he'd read the Bible a little bit and read after Paul. And everybody talks about Apostle Paul. Every great preacher does. And they talk about Apostle Paul this, Apostle Paul that. He was the greatest preacher to ever live, probably other than Jesus Christ, and wrote 13 epistles in the Bible and was a great man. And this young preacher, he said, Lord... Help me to be just like Paul. Lord, I want to be just like him. Lord, let me be like Paul. And the next day he's walking down the street and these guys drug him in the alley, mugged him and robbed him, beat him half to death. He woke up in the hospital room, beat up, all all his money gone. And they kept him for about four or five days in the hospital. He said, Lord, help me, Lord, just help me be like Paul. Just help me be like Paul. And he got out of the hospital. They put him in the car and was taking him home. And he got hit, got in a wreck on the way home, had a crash. And the EMS come to get him. He's still alive. He didn't die. As you put him on the stretcher, put him in the ambulance, he said, Lord, forget that. I don't want to be like Paul. Forget it. I don't be like me. You know what? It finally hit him after two accidents and two wrecks and two sets of suffering. I don't want to be like that because Paul said, I've gone through a whole lot of things for the gospel's sake. Amen. Number three, you're dreaming if you think you're going to have standards without sincerity. If you're going to have some standards, you're going to have to be sincere about some things. It's going to have to mean something to you. It's going to have to mean something to you, brother and sister. Standards without sincerity. We're going to have to be sincere in our principles. I mean, talking about the things and the, uh, our convictions that we raise our kids on and the things we stand for. I mean, brother, you better be sincere about it because there's going to come a day you may have to fight over it. Hey, brother, a conviction ain't no count if you can't fight over it. If it don't mean enough to you to get in a brawl, it ain't a conviction, brother. A conviction is something you'll die for and go down swinging for. Amen. Be sincere in your principles. Be sincere in your priorities. Get your, get your priorities the way you're going to live and stick with them. I told my wife the other day, I said, I, you know, looking back over your life, have you ever felt like you've been a failure about everything you've ever done? Everybody, anybody ever felt that way? Nobody but me? I felt that way a bunch of times. Brother, he shaking his head, no, I ain't felt like a failure. Have you? And he looked at his wife and said, yeah, got you, brother. She wasn't looking. He said no, and he looked at her and said, yeah. But I told, told my wife one day, we was talking, I said, you know what? One thing I can honestly say, and I'm not bragging on myself, but I said, I've got the same standards I had 30-some years ago. I've stuck with them. If anything, my kids have grown up and said, Daddy's the same as he was when we was real little. He ain't changed. He's still preaching against the same thing he preached against and still preaching for the same thing he preached for. And he's still preaching out of the same book he preached out of when we was babies. You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about those, uh, those principles and those priorities. Get your priorities in order. And, brother, whatever your priorities are, and you live by them and raise your family by them, that's what they'll live by and that's what they'll believe. But if you raise him up and church don't mean nothing, and it's second or third or fourth down the list, that's exactly how them boys and them girls are going to turn out. Priorities don't mean nothing anymore. Priorities don't mean nothing to folks anymore. I mean, brother, it's like going to church don't mean nothing. Tithing don't mean nothing. I mean, brother, people would rather go out and do all this other stuff and just whatever. And if we get around to going to church, we'll go. And priorities will hurt you. Oh, preacher, you're just, yeah, yeah, I am. I am saying it because it's true, bless God. You get all this other junk knock you out of church. You say, oh, it ain't going to hurt this on the wings. And I keep telling yourself that. Who are you trying to convince, me or you? Right. Amen, brother. That's right. You, you, you say, oh, well, the Bible don't say this. The Bible don't say that. And so we don't have to do this. Anybody starts talking like that knows they're doing wrong and they're trying to ease their own conscience. That's all they're doing. I don't even argue with them anymore. I just, I just grunt and nod my head and walk off and go eat a bowl of ice cream. Amen, Amen brother. I've been in long enough to know how crazy people are. People's crazy. Animals ain't even crazy as humans are. Man, y'all was hollering and shouting a while ago. What happened to you? I must have hit somebody's little feelings. Bless your little heart. It's a good day. Brother Kevin started that song off right, and I've been preaching hard. Everything's been good so far. 
Amen, brother. But I'm saying you better be sincere about your principles and your priorities because that is the way you're going to raise and structure those families. I'm talking to the daddies now. Father's Day's next weekend, but daddies now need to be daddies and men need to be men. Brother, this I've never seen such a day and age where men ain't men no more. I can't tell men from women. I ain't talking about their hair either or how they dress. I'm just talking about men just ain't men no more. Men can't make decisions. They can't take a stand on nothing. They can't even give you their opinion without asking their wife. Amen. Honest. And I'm not being mean. That's my wife. I'm sweet. She tells me all the time how sweet I am. It about makes me mad. I ain't sweet. About cuss her. I ain't sweet. I'm a man. I was about to step in something and drag it through the house if I have to prove I'm a man. But I'm just saying, you take five or six men and be standing around somewhere uh, doing something or looking at an old car, and one phone can ring and all seven of them can run off. Go to go. Sweetheart gold. I'm not saying you should be an overbearing ogre and, and all like that. If your wife needs you, you should go to her. But I'm just saying, brother, be a man. We need men to grow up and be the head of the house and raise that family. Give us some structure and some discipline and some boundaries. And that wife will look up to you and love you. And so will those kids with respect. Priorities. Principles, priorities, and patterns. That's just what I've been preaching about. A pattern. Proverbs 23, 26, everybody ought to read that. Every man should read that and make his son read it. Proverbs 23, 26, this, he said this, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. The best thing I can do with my boys is say, Now, boys, listen, I ain't perfect, but listen, just watch me. Just watch how I live. Watch how I treat your mama, and you'll know how to treat your girlfriend. Amen? Watch how I deal with people out in public, and you'll know how you're supposed to act. If I don't act like an idiot, then you'll know that you're supposed to act normal. But if I go out and beat my wife and drinking and smoking, I'm such a low-down, lazy, worthless bum, I won't work, then I'm going to raise a bunch of bums that's going to expect welfare to keep them up. Preach it right there, brother. What do you think is bankrupt in our country anyway? Our government rewards people for shacking up. No, we don't want you to get married. We want you to live together so we can feed you a little bit longer. Listen, brother, I, listen, those programs are good for what they're for, but it ain't to reward people for living in sin. Amen. Truth to truth, brother. I, listen, there's some things I'm afraid of, but preaching truth ain't one of them. I love you. Some things scare me. My wife will give me a certain look scared me a little bit. But preaching truth don't scare me because I know that I'm standing on the truth. Standards without sincerity. And I will say last of all, some of you already got through before I did. But, it, but my fourth point is this. You must be dreaming. If you think you're going to have sin without sadness, it ain't going to happen. Have y'all ever seen any of these, you ever seen any of these shows on TV about, about people that's on drugs and stuff? I saw a show the other day. It was on. I didn't watch it. I just saw just a clip, just a five minutes of it. I was on my way out the door, and they was arresting these people. I don't know what they was arresting for drugs, I guess. And there's a couple of young women there. It kind of hurt my feelings. I told my wife, I said, look at that. These girls were pretty girls. I'm not talking about trashy looking. I mean, they're pretty, good looking women in their 20s and 30s. They look like Candace, Ashley, Caitlin, some of these girls, just attractive, nice. And you could tell, brother, the devil done put them through the ringer. This one lady had that, what they call that, what they call that slack jaw or drop jaw that that crystal meth gives them. And her face was sinking in, and the size of her cheeks was already gray. She's like 25 years old. She had big old sores all through her, all of her face. Her body's covered. Now you're crazy if you think you're going to have a good time sin and not have some remorse. Listen, you know what the devil's going to do to you if you let him? He's going to put you through the meat grinder, son. Here's what a lot of Christian kids think. They think, well, I'm in a good church. I'm in a good Christian family. I'm going to be okay. Even if I do be dabble around and sin and have a little fun. No, you ain't going to be okay. Me and Debbie's riding down the road the other night. We was somewhere off from here in another town. We was riding through, come to the stoplight. And there was a lady come through this, this intersection with a grocery cart and had all her stuff. No, it was a pair of hand trucks and had all her stuff strapped on. She's a street person. You've tested it on the street. Looked like she's about 35, rough. I mean, you could tell she'd had it rough, brother. That's sad, man. I told Debbie, I said, look. I said, that right there is somebody's daughter. Probably somebody's mama. Some man somewhere, that's his sister. He don't know where she's at. You know what the sad thing about it is? I said, if we'd stop her and take her and fed her and put her in a motel and got her some help, it wouldn't do a lick of good. 
because she ain't through yet. Sin puts you through something. The preacher told me just this week, you know, we've been going through all this mess with these homosexuals being mad at us, and that just worries me to death. It hurts my feelings. <laughs> I'm glad to know I made the devil's crowd mad. Come on up, Ronnie, get us a, get us get ready to sing for us. This preacher told me that there was a fellow, this fellow man of God was talking to this guy that was a dabbling in the homosexual lifestyle. Show you what sin will do to you. See, kids, here's what it does. Sin is fun. None of us are preaching it ain't fun. It is fun. It's a blast. But getting loose from it, that's the hard part. Because you can't. You can't get loose from it. This is what this guy, this preacher sitting in his truck, Brother Jeff, talking to this guy, been dabbling around the homosexual lifestyle. He said, son, he said, he said you need to ask Jesus to help. He said, preacher, he said, I, he said, I know. He said, I'm, I'm messing around this stuff. And he said, it's, he said, you just don't know. Preacher said, well, your problem is you just need to, you just need to turn loose and just, you just need to trust God and pray about it. And turn your back on it. He said, you don't understand, preacher. He said, I don't have it. He said, it, it has me. Preacher said, no, you don't understand. God can deliver you and blah, blah, blah. And he said, that guy's whole countenance changed. He said, he looked like another person. He said, he looked at him and said, you don't get it, do you? He said, I told you, I don't have it. It has me. And it won't let me go. And he opened the door of that truck and got out and he ain't seen him since. You see, kids, the trick that the devil pulls, he lets you have enough fun to where you think you got it. You, you hear people like me or Brother Sam give her testimony how they're out on drugs and alcohol and all that stuff. But what you don't understand, we're just the, just the small minority that happen to escape by God's marvelous grace and mercy and, and the miracle working power of a praying mama. That's the only reason we're even here. It's the only reason I'm even alive. Most of them don't make it once they get out there and sin. And once they get started to get a good head of steam up and they get to uh, committing fornication and drugs and alcohol and all that stuff. And like Brother Jared preached at camp last year, you don't know how to do none of that stuff. It don't matter. The devil's got something that'll train you. Free of charge. But it'll cost you down the road. Y'all have heard me tell this before. You might say, well, preacher, you turned out all right. No, I didn't. No telling what I'd have done for God if I hadn't got out and sinned and throw my life away for four or five years. We was riding, I was preaching in North Carolina a few years ago, and was riding down the road, me and Debbie. Hadn't been that neck of the woods, Brother Kevin, in years. And I drove right by, Brother Jeff, I drove by a package store. And I slowed down and told Debbie, I said, you see that place right there? Just a little old, them little hole in the wall, places you can drive around back, and they come out to your car and bring to your car, pack cigarettes and a six-pack, and you drive out, drive through. I said, right there's the first place I ever bought a beer and drunk it. Big old tears. I said, I'd give you anything if I could go back. I remember sitting in that, that little place behind that store with a buddy of mine, drinking those couple little beers, and got a little buzz. And I thought, this ain't so bad. My daddy preaches and screams and cries and begs people to get saved and runs up and down the road and wore his body out. I don't see the big deal. But I told Debbie as I drove by that day, I said, boy, I'd give anything if I'd have never, if I'd have never took the top off of one of them. Because that first beer didn't get me, Brother Heath. Two or three years later, I couldn't put it down. I'd wake up on Sunday morning so drunk and so sick. The worst sick you've ever been is a drunk sick. And you're puking and you're dry heaving and there's nothing left. And it feels like the line in your stomach's coming out. And you know what you want? You don't want ham and eggs. You want some more of that rot gut that puts you there. Something inside of you wants it. Oh God, if I could just get another drink in me. If I could just some little more Jack Daniels or George Dickel. If I could just get me a, just another hit of that wild turkey. Knowing good and well it's killing you. These people they had on that show the other night, I'll eat up with them sores. They knew that there's poison in that drug and it's killing them. Putting them in an early grave and they're abandoning their kids and their family. But they're still doing it. Sin is more powerful than what you think. You think sin is just something the preacher gets up and hoops and hollers about, but I've seen the power of it, and I've seen what it does to people. Uh, you, you can watch the commercials, how they talk about beer and liquor, and they make those funny commercials to make it seem cute, but it don't show people on the side of the road with the EMS picking up dead bodies and trying to figure out who in the world they are. They don't show you the picture of the highway patrolman standing on a man's front porch saying, I don't know how I'm going to do this. But i got to tell this man that his son and his daughter's dead. 
Because some drunk run over them. Sin's powerful. You're dreaming if you think you can have sin without sadness. It's time God's people woke up. It's time the world woke up. Let's stand this morning.